Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cherry the Geek TV. My name's Joe Van Orney. Uh, in the early morning hours of July 1st, uh, 1981, five people were brutally beaten by intruders in a house located in the Laurel Canyon neighborhood of Los Angeles. Uh, four of those five people would die. Uh, the crud Quadruple murder would go by many names over the years, uh, started as the four on the floor murder, uh, was known as the Laurel Canyon murders, and it's also known as the Wonderland murders, which uh, is named after the street Wonderland Avenue, which the house uh, resided on. Uh, detectives Tom Lang and Bob Souza are the two lead detectives on the Wonderland case. They wrote a book. Uh, which was published a few years ago called Malice in Wonderland, the inside story of the police investigation of the Laurel Can Canyon murders. And now they can be heard in a brand new podcast, which is coming out July 1st uh, on the 40th anniversary of the murders from Audible Documentaries. It's a podcast written, narrated, and produced by crime writer Michael Connolly. And today, the detectives are here with us to talk about this podcast. Podcast, by the way, is called The Wonderland Murders and the Secret History of Hollywood. And today, we are joined by Detectives Tom Lang and Detective Bob Souza. Gentlemen, welcome to Cherry the Geek TV. Hi, Joe. Hello, Joe. Good, Good to see you, Joe. Good nice to meet you. you. Well, we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of the murders. Uh, this podcast is coming out uh, 40 years to the day on July 1st of this year, 40 years to the day of the murders. Uh, it's a famous case for those that that grew up in Los Angeles, that resided in Los Angeles, uh, uh, for those outside of Los Angeles uh, that are of a certain age, uh, it might uh, have spark recollections because of some of the, the key participants, uh, pseudo celebrities involved in the case uh, that made national news. But for those that that maybe aren't aware or younger generation or, or people who aren't aware of that or people that need reminding, tell people what the Wonderland murder case is about, uh, kind of lay out the scene and, and, and how you both got involved. How much time we got? <laughs> no, I've got 40 <laughs> years. There is a cram 40 years into 20 minutes. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff to begin with. This was a, obviously to us, it was a retribution for a robbery of a very well-known organized crime dope dealer in the Los Angeles area by the name of Ed Nash. This Wonderland group is known to knock off dope dealers and other people. One of them was a hired murderer. Uh, they're good for robberies and everything else. And uh, John Holmes, the porn actor, is kind of the linchpin between the organized crime dope dealer because that was he where he's getting his dope from. And, and this wonderland group who he used to hang with and holmes had the big idea that uh, maybe it'd be a good idea to rip off ed nash because he always has a lot of dope around and a lot of cash and he's got a couple of bodyguards so you got to be careful so they concocted this plan with the wonderland group two days before these murders and holmes was to leave the rear sliding glass door in nash's home open so that these uh, bad guys from Wonderland could sneak in the back and rip off Nash and his bodyguards. And this happened and went down and uh, Nash was taken by surprise along with his bodyguard. There was an accidental shooting. The bodyguard got shot in the side and Nash panicked and they really humiliated him. They slapped him around. They stuck a gun down his mouth, then down his crotch, then his mouth. And like I said, they wounded the... Uh, uh, the bodyguard, a fellow by the name of Greg Dials, and they ripped him off for probably several hundred thousand dollars and quite a bit of uh, cocaine. And they took off after tying up Nash and his bodyguard. Well, Nash, to try to cut this down a little bit, Nash found out about all this and uh, knew, found out that Holmes was, was a man that set this thing up. And they got a hold of Holmes and they beat it out of him. And he admitted to it, admitted who was involved. So at this point, uh, Nash was furious, man with a hell of a temper. He decided to get retaliation and he set up four, possibly five suspects to go back to the Wonderland home, 8763 Wonderland in the Hollywood Hills, which is just like two miles as a crow flies from Nash's home. Uh, to go in there and take care of business and they were to send a message and the message would be sent with pipes. That was how these uh, 
these folks would be attacked. And about 4 a.m., uh, he sent them over there. And as prearranged, John Holmes met him at the door about 4 a.m. and let him in, knowing full well what their intention was going to be. And these four or five men with pipes entered and they just nailed everybody in the house. There were five victims, four of which who were killed and one survived it, Susie Lanius. They were beaten severely. And again, this was to send a message. Then the, the house was tossed. Uh, there were also some guns and other weapons that were taken by the, uh, the robbers initially from Nash. They got those back. They got some of the dope back. The big point of contention now was, was John Holmes actually a part of this? Well, there's circumstantial evidence to say that he was and that he took a whack at one of the uh, Wonderland gang that we've been having problems with because we found his left palm on the left uh, brass bed railing above the body of Ron Lanius, one of the victims. That and the fact that he let them in, knowing full well what their intentions were, would make him, in the eyes of the law, a participant in the murders. Anyway, uh, this went on for, well, 20 years. And during this time, there were three trials, uh, one for John Holmes, who was acquitted. Uh, there were three dope trials with Ed Nash. The federal people got involved on RICO statues because they were looking at Nash for other things. During this time, uh, there were two other people who died, probably from hot shots from Nash, who maybe knew too much. Holmes fled. Uh, I went down there and with someone else and arrested him. Some months after, we brought him back for the trial. And again, like I said, this went on and on and on. There were attempts to bribe us. Uh, that didn't work because we don't get bribed. Uh, there was an attempt at, uh, with uh, a corrupt, I'll call him a corrupt cop, who came to us and tried to sell us off. Nash himself offered us a bribe. There were witnesses who were intimidated. In one of the trials, one of the witnesses was bought off and hung this, the first uh, trial up, 11 to 1 for conviction. That particular witness ended up in the witness protection program because money wasn't paid to the proper person at the proper time. And her brother was shot because he didn't make those deliveries. And so she panicked and ran to the DA. This, of course, is long after the acquittal, the, on, which happened during the second trial. And she went into witness protection. There was a judge who was bought off. There were other witnesses that were bought off. And again, this went on for like 20 years all the way until uh, 1999, at which time he was indicted through RICO statute. And uh, he had pled out and got like, I don't know, I think he served eight or nine months uh, in, in jail because of that. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened in between. Like I said, there was a dirty federal agent who so implicated- let's, So let's, let's pause there for a sec, because we, we've, we've uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover. We're oh gonna yeah, back, we're going to back up a second. I'm going to ask. I'm going to do some follow up questions on here. So, so the murders happen. Uh, Tom, you. I mean, there are other officers, uh, of course, that dis that were called to the scene, discovered the bodies. Uh, and but but between the two of you, Tom, you were the first one on the scene, correct? That no, was, I was. Uh, I mean, be between you and Bob. Yeah, uh, yeah, between Bob and myself, yeah. So talk about uh, when you got that call, when you arrive on the scene, uh, how did this crime scene uh, compare to other crime scenes you had worked, uh, you know, up until that time? This was, yeah. this was a well, pretty brutal crime scene. Yeah, I want to get Bob in this too, but I'll, I'll just say briefly that I went in and it was, needless to say, very bloody because when any time there's headshots, there's a lot of blood. There were uh, three victims downstairs and two upstairs blood splatters everywhere. Uh, it was clear that this was a dope house. It was clear that this was a, a payback with a message. Uh, the place was a mess. In fact, Bob and I spent almost two full days and nights at that location just doing the crime scene. And it was hot outside. At a crime scene, you don't touch things and move them around until they've been dealt with, until they've been uh, properly documented, photographed, we also did a video walkthrough of the bodies at the time. 
This was also one of the first times the video has been used, I believe, right? That, that uh... it was In California, it was the first time a video had been used as evidence in a murder trial uh, that had been taken of the crime scene with the bodies in it. Yeah, yeah. that was the first. Um, so we were there a long time and uh, something like 30, 34 hours or something like that. A lot went on, obviously, during that time. It was closed in. Uh, it was a nasty scene. But uh, I want Bob to jump in, too. And uh, a lot of other things happened. So, Bob, you want to pick up with maybe with the phone calls or something? Yeah, sure. The uh, I think this case had so many uh, side issues involved. Uh, from the get-go, it was a, a little ironic that when T Tom and I had never worked together before, and his partner was on vacation, and I'd been working by myself for a period of time. But uh, when we were walking out of the office, it was the 4th of July weekend in 1981. We walked out of the office, and I mentioned to Tom, I said, you know, with our luck, we're going to catch a, a, a quadruple axe murder in the Hollywood Hills this, this weekend. <laughs> well, we, got a, we did get a quadruple. But when I got, by the time I got there, I was fighting traffic. When I got there, Tom was on the sidewalk. He had his sleeves rolled up, clipboard in hand. And when I walked up, um, I said, uh, this isn't going to screw up my 4th of July weekend, is it? And I was being a little flip at the time, not realizing exactly what was inside. Uh, Tom, I knew from his game face, uh, it was time to get furious. And he said, uh, get your galoshes ready. I'm going to walk you through. So he walked me through and was pointing out things that he had seen uh, through his, his initial walkthrough. And we both decided just from what we could see inside the house that it was a get back murder. Uh, it was revenge. It was an overkill to the point that uh, why not just put a bolt in everybody's head and take the money and dope and run. It was more than that. They were sending a message. Uh, we call it a get back murder. Um, like Tom said, we spent uh, almost two days there just photographing, fingerprinting. There were, there were blood splatters everywhere. Um, there were striation marks from a threaded pipe that were evident in the, uh, in the, wall, the, uh, in the walls around the house. Um, by the time the bodies were removed, um, the phone was ringing off the hook the whole time. We didn't really want to touch it because it hadn't been fingerprinted. We finally got it printed. When I started answering the phone, I mean, all these calls were coming in. Hey, is Ronnie there? You know, I need to score, man. I'm hurting. So all these guys, I was taking down names of these people playing playing a little game, you know. I said, uh, hey, you know, uh, one of the, our victims was uh, Ron Lanius. I said, you know, Ronnie's not here right now, man. What can I do for you? So I was getting information from various people, which did help us uh, somewhat uh, later on. I, but, I think I, I understand that the, one of the key breaks – early on was you had closed down the crime scene and left. And then you got a phone call that somebody had broken into the, that somebody was in the house and that person, once you got there, uh, uh, that was the person that led you to Eddie Nash. Is that, is, is that correct? Exactly. He was one of the residents of the house. He was part of the group that were uh, ripping off other dope dealers. And he thought originally that his, his girlfriend was a survivor. Turned out it wasn't. Um, we, took him down to Hollywood station and Tom and I took him in the interview room and we kind of let him go. We let, we let him ramble. Uh, he was popping pills like crazy from the time we got there and got him handcuffed in the station. He'd already stashed a bunch of pills in his pockets and he started pulling them out of his pockets and saying, Hey, this is a red devil. Uh, this is a cartwheel. And he was just popping his pill. We let him go. We just let him do what he wanted to do because he was starting to tell us everything we wanted. He broke the case wide open for us basically. So, uh, and we should mention that there was the survivor, Susan, uh, wasn't able to help because she had a brain injury and, and had, didn't have any memory of the incident. So you were strictly going by uh, witnesses and, and investigations and, and what you could uncover. Uh, Pretty much, yeah. So it that led you to... For Susan, it took a while for Susan really to come around. She was severely beaten. I mean, her, uh, most of her skull was missing. Uh, was cracked and like you drop an egg off of a roof, basically. But it was pretty miraculous that she came back with what she did. I mean, she remembered, even though they're all in a heroin daze, she actually remembered uh, big figures and a metallic object, but she could never identify anybody or 
by voice or by recognition. So she wasn't a big help in that respect. So I'm going to jump forward now. We're, we only have a, a little bit of time left, and I want to get to the, the, the podcast uh, portion of this. Uh, but uh, before we do, we, we'll jump ahead to the, the trial. Uh, there's three different trials. John Holmes is acquitted. Uh, Eddie Nash is acquitted. Uh, why, looking at the case, I, it's pretty evident, right, that these are the guys that they're guilty. They're acquitted. Why do you think? What What was it that the jury didn't see, or what 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 do you think is the reasoning that that you weren't able to the the prosecutors weren't able to get convictions? On well, I think the jury did see everything. The problem was that uh, at least one that we know was bought off, as I explained earlier. Uh, the second trial was actually. 11 to 1 for guilt. The first trial was actually 11 to 1 for guilt. Mm -hmm. The six alternates said they would have voted guilt. But this one 18-year-old girl said, no, I don't uh, I don't trust cops, and uh, I don't think he did it, and that held it up. If that one jury had been recused and an alternate was appointed, as normally happens, there would have been a guilty plea the first time around. The second time around makes you wonder. I mean, who else was perhaps bought off? We already know they're cops, witnesses. We already know that there was a juror bought off. Who else did he get to? We already know there was a dirty federal agent involved that said we were in bed with organized crime who caused our department to investigate us and follow us around for about two months until they found nothing that was all that was, that we were involved with anybody, which was the way it was. That was done on purpose to derail the investigation and it actually worked for a number of years. But who else did Nash get to and Nash's people get to? He was very well insulated and he owned a lot of people. So did that happen again? I don't think we'll ever know. And what about John Holmes? So he, he's uh, also acquitted. He, I think there's no doubt he was in the house. His palm print, like you said, was 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 on. Curious location <laughs> above yeah. the, the battered head of Belonius. So then the question is, was he a willing accomplice or was right. he co coerced and and told like you didn't need to, to be there and, and possibly hit them so that you're involved in, but he didn't want to be there. Uh, do you think that's why he was acquitted? The jury couldn't determine? That's, well, he had two excellent lawyers and they were straight laced lawyers and they pointed to other people. Um, and it was part of what you said of course, uh, if you, you know, you go along with a murder, it's, it's no defense for murder. The rest is no defense for murder in California. And they played that, but they just were more empathetic. It was obvious, more empathetic with Holmes and his plight than a, a bunch of gang dope dealers and killers and robbers getting murdered. I just don't think they had the empathy, nor did they care much about that. And Holmes was a celebrity. All of those things probably worked themselves into that. Uh, and those things happen. People take those things personally and, and they don't look at evidence perhaps as they should all the time. I just want to add that we, we cooperated over the years. In fact, recently we even cooperated further that Holmes was intentionally involved um, for whatever reasons. He didn't like Lanius. We knew that, but uh he was a willing participant, we believe, and not maybe, maybe not just one blow, but maybe several, and possibly on some of the other victims. We're not sure. So you both wrote this book, uh, uh, Malice in Wonderland, uh, where you talk, give your side of the, the case. Uh, Michael Connolly, who, who's done the new podcast, says that he, he thinks this is the definitive book about the case. Uh, Michael Connolly comes along now he's uh 40th anniversary is coming up he says i'm going to do a write an eight-part podcast documentary podcast uh the wonderland murders and the secret history of hollywood uh you are both participants in the uh podcast uh this from i've listened to the first four parts of the podcast it seems like what makes this podcast new and different and adds to the to the story is uh, he does extensive interviews with Scott Thorson. 
And yes. Scott Thorson, uh, for those that don't know, was Liberace's uh, companion for many years. Uh, they made a movie behind the candelabra. He wrote a book behind the candelabra. It was turned into a movie with Michael Douglas as, as Liberace and Matt Damon played uh, the Scott Thorson character. Uh, Scott Thorson has, I guess, is the missing witness. He was, if, if you believe him, uh, uh, Michael Connolly makes the case that he's an unreliable narrator. He may be telling the truth. He may not. He may have something to gain by telling this story. Uh, you have to listen to the podcast to, to come up with the conclusion. What uh, Talk about Scott Thorson uh, and, and what you think. Uh, I don't know if we want to give away the what the podcast concludes uh is scott thorson a unreliable narrator or is he or do you think he's he's oh. telling the truth let's start well, with say something Not i'll just say something really quick and then let tom finish off but thorson was uh he was just a real minor uh, person of interest early on in the investigation we knew of him but we never really realized the significance of him it came later after I had retired, Tom and his other partner had uh, conversations with Thorson. And that, that it, 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 it got to the point where he became a serious person of interest. I'll let Tom go into that. I was just going to say, not all liars lie all the time. There's a little truth sometimes in what everybody says, even though it's not completely 100%, whatever. Uh, and that's Scott. He talks out of both sides of his mouth. We were able to corroborate some things, but as Bob alluded to, he started to look to, he was there early in the case and then he just split and he only came back when he was in jail years later and they did a favor and he came back with this story. Now we were able to corroborate much of that story, but his credibility has is, is always been in question because of that. And of course, when he testified, the defense got all over him. Was he there just before the killings? I believe he was. I believe he was at Nash's house. I believe that he uh, he knows probably a little more than he uh, than he said. Uh, so it's a different angle. It hasn't been explored, and so it's going to be uh, going to be interesting as this thing goes on to see uh, what people think of Scott Thorson. Yeah, for those that are interested in this case, uh, there's hours of interviews uh, in the podcast that uh, Michael Connolly does with Scott Thorson. And he's I think this is the first time he's gone in depth publicly uh, telling right. his telling his version of the story and 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 where he was and and, and how he recalls certain things went down with with uh, Eddie Nash and, and John Holmes. Uh, the podcast is called The Wonderland Murders and the Secret History of Hollywood. It comes out uh, uh, from Audible on July 1st. Uh, final question. The case has gone on for 40 years. Uh, it's uh, a notorious case. There's been many books about it, many uh, movies. Uh, there's a scene in the movie Boogie Nights that's loosely based on the John Holmes, uh, John Holmes uh, encounter. Uh, what is it about this particular uh, murder and, and crime that you think has, has allowed it to be, stay in the public consciousness for 40 years? Is it, is it the fact that there were resemblances to the Manson, the Tate Lobianco murders with the intruders in the house? Was it the fact that there was a pseudo celebrity involved, John Holmes? Was it the fact that uh, it, uh, the brutal nature of the, the crime? Is it the fact that it's nobody was ever convicted, so it's technically an unsolved case, even though we, we suspect who did it, um, but, but for legal purposes, it, you know, no one ever uh, faced, faced uh, punishment, or is a combination of all of that? What, what do you think, what, do you, what, what is it that's kept this case in the public consciousness? Well, for years? to begin with, uh, Ed Nash did plead guilty to uh, conspiracy not for the murders because he'd already been acquitted. So it is solved. Uh, there are no other murders. When all else fails, you have to go the evidence, an old axiom, an old homicide axiom. What, what attracts people, I think, is if you look real hard at this case, there's absolutely nothing it doesn't have. I mean, it has the dope dealing and the celebrity and the bad guys and the, and the, the sex angle and, and uh, corruption at all levels. Um, there's just nothing it doesn't have. And of course, there are unanswered questions. 
Uh, Bob and I are not Hollywood types. We're not actors. However, we do this to more to educate people as to what really happened. That's why we wrote the book in the first place, not to entertain, but to educate. And hopefully we've done that. And we'll give another plug to your book, uh, Malice in Wonderland, the inside story of the police investigation of the Laurel Canyon murders. You can buy it on Amazon or at your local books, order from your local bookseller. And the podcast, The Wonderland Murders and the Secret History of Hollywood from Audible comes out on July 1st. Uh, Detectives, thank you so much uh, for your work over the years and for talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you, Joe. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks.